Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grillin' JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good, Conrad. Good, good to see you. Good to see out here and see all the fans. So, uh, interesting show this morning or today, whatever, whatever time you're watching it, listen to it. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty good. You know, I've got this little cancer issue I'm trying to deal with and, uh, going to start doing radiation soon. I think I'd do 22 radiation treatments. Damn, that so, sucks, dude. 22. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, somehow I got to figure it out how to do it on consecutive days. They'd like to do it every day for, you know, I think it's three weeks or something or whatever it is, maybe longer than that. I, didn't care. I haven't kept track. It, it, it's the inevitable. It's coming. I got to deal with it. So I haven't found myself buried in the minutia of when this is happening and that's happening. I don't plan on missing any work according to my doctors. So that's good. That's great. Yeah. It's just a matter of, you know, dealing with the issues and gritting your teeth and moving on. That's kind of what I'm doing. But, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate all the fans who have reached out on social media and so forth, uh, giving me their encouragement and prayers and so forth. You know, I don't have, uh, I have a, the lesser, I didn't, I didn't get to, I can't remember the name of the damn thing, the worst kind of skin cancer, whatever that is, I don't have. Uh, so it's, uh, one of those deals, part of the journey, you know, and I got to deal with it and I will deal with it. No doubt about it. Just a pain in the ass to get all these treatments. The good the thing is there's no chemotherapy. So that helps, uh, with all the after effects and things of that nature. So I'll, I'm. I'm just, you know, just handling it, you know, I'm dealing with, it. uh, I've, I've dealt with more and, uh, we'll continue to persevere, you know, as we're recording this Connie, uh, today is Jan's 60th birthday. Oh, wow. Man, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. She's been 60 today. She would not want me to say that public, but uh, I, guess, <laughs> I guess right now it's okay. Uh, so, you know, it's just life. Life continues to go on and, and we have to deal with the situations and the hands that we're dealt and, and move forward. I know, I don't know any other way to approach it. And, uh, so it's, it's going to be fun and to get healthy. I feel healthy now, but, oh, it's just another, it's another, uh, turn in the road, buddy. You know how that shit goes. So I'm going to deal with it like a man, you know, it's, it's all, it's all good. If I hadn't, I, I said this to somebody the other day, if Jan had been alive. Uh, this would never have happened because she saw, she would have seen that little spot on my ankle. It didn't get to be, it got to be a beer spot, but she should have seen that and would have gone to the doctor taking care of it. But here I'm trying to be John Wayne and, uh, who's looking over my, uh, left shoulder right now and be that guy instead of just being smart. So that's my, that's on me, but it should have been around. It just would have been taken care of, but she's not. 
and, it, and it's so I, I'm taking care of it. It's just a matter of starting and moving forward. So but I do appreciate everybody's support. It's, it means a lot, quite frankly, that people give it care enough to uh, send me a message, whether it be on Twitter or Facebook or wherever it may be. So I appreciate that. Uh, and again, I'm feeling good. So, you know, Henry, feeling good. My Sooners are doing well. The Sooners won a game. They're off this weekend. Much like your Crimson Tide was off last weekend. Uh, so, you know, still, I'm enjoying my best life. It's just a matter of there's just some things coming along that I hadn't planned on dealing with. But uh, the great thing about Jacksonville, my kids are wondering why I don't get my treatment here in Oklahoma. Because I'm four, four miles away from the Mayo Clinic in oh, wow. Jacksonville. So if I get into a jam... I got the best doctors, uh, for me within 10 minute drive of the house. So that, that's important. It's funny how the older you get, how your priorities change, Conrad. I agree. You know, good doctors, you know, we all like our doctors. So anyway, that's where that is. And the other, other thing I want to clarify a little bit, I was kind of overwhelmed. You and I are kicking the, kicking the tires on this one uh, before we start recording on the, uh, black hat farms, uh, cannabis venture. You know what? Here, here's a story on that deal. My daughter and her husband are going to, are creating the business. They created the business plan. <clears throat> they created everything in that regard. I bought some land to build some grow houses on, and I funded them the seed money to get this thing started. That's going to be hopefully my involvement. I may help with some marketing stuff or some names or things like that, you know, uh, but bottom line is I wanted to do something for my kids while I was still alive. And I thought it was important to help them get this project started. And so they don't have a debt service to a, to a bank or something. And uh, it's made me feel good that I've been able to help them, uh, and see the, and see the results. So, uh, you know, we hope to be up and doing something in 2022. Uh, I'm not sure when the, when the, they're going to harvest and all that stuff. I'm not involved in that. I don't, I don't, I haven't even seen the land I bought. Wow. Uh, it's near Tulsa. So, uh, but I, my daughter's, uh, really a good marketer, good planner. She's very successful in her work. My son-in-law was a school teacher at Tulsa Rogers high school. He's a smart kid. Uh, and they studied this. So I'm, I did it for them, not for JR. But I think we're going to use the black hat uh, thing. That's, that was our idea. So anyway, uh, that's where we are with that deal. I'm not going to be out there every day, uh, you know, working in the in the farm. But they are, and that's good enough for me. So there's kind of a little, two couple of updates there uh, on that matter. So, but other than that, it's all good. You know, AEW business is good. You know, we're tickets. We're selling tickets for our, for our TV tapings like crazy. And that sure makes it for a better television show when you got people there that care and are emotionally invested. It makes it so much better. And it's uh, amazing when you look back, Conrad, all of all those weeks after weeks after weeks that we had uh, nobody in the house but our own people. And now we've got fans that want to be there. They feel good about being there. So that's all great. They're starting to bring their posters and signs back. You know, the, the, the emotion of, is all great. So it's good stuff, man. So, uh, but we just keep moving along. The podcast here is doing well. We appreciate everybody's uh, support of that. Conrad's empire is when I look at the top 10 or 20 or whatever, uh, rankings of pro wrestling podcasts, you know, uh, Conrad's crew is we, we, uh, we dominate. We normally always have the number one show and, uh, one of us, let's go feel good to you. Right. Hey, it doesn't suck. You know, it's, uh, it's been fun. We greatly appreciate everybody's support. Hope you'll check out all that we're doing over at adfreeshows.com. But I want to circle back to something that you've really been a champion of. I mean, you've sort of been a champion of men's health for a long time where you would tell guys, Hey, if you're waking up in the middle of the night, peeing, or if you're snoring, et cetera, et cetera, you probably need to look into getting a CPAP machine. Yes. And you've probably helped a lot of people. Uh, length their lives with that advice. Is there a teachable moment? Is there some, some wise wisdom you can pass down about your 
skin cancer discovery? Well, here's the thing skin cancer is the most, uh, uh, widely spread, no pun intended cancer in, in, in existence. In other words, more people have skin cancer than any other form of cancer. Uh, so it's not a secret. It's not, you know, something that we don't talk about it's there, but because it's perceived as less serious than having it in your, in an organ, uh, internally, then, you know, maybe we don't pay as much attention to it. Uh, I had a spot on my ankle. And it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And I didn't know what it was. And to be quite honest with you folks, I was, just, I was afraid of what the, what the diagnosis might be. It was exactly what I didn't want to hear. And I was afraid at 69 to go start battling cancer. Uh, but you know, it's, that's the fight I'm in. Uh, but the, uh, it's smart and I'll do this going forward. And I guarantee a lot of people won't do it because the pain is the pain in the butt to make your doctor's appointment and go to see the doctor, et cetera, et cetera. But having a once a year, uh, uh, review of your skin at, in a dermatologist's office is imperative. I had this one spot on my leg, which was, uh, significant. I, I posted a picture of it on Twitter and I got, uh, it was, it was hor in hindsight, I wish I hadn't done it, but it was horrible looking. And I ignored it for some stupid reason. Uh, but you should get a skin cancer, a skin uh, evaluation every year. It's, go, it's a matter than just looking at you. And uh, I, when I went to the doctor, Conrad, I had that one spot on my leg that I thought was the, it. And the doctor said, take your shirt off. And I did. And he found two more spots on my back. Well, hell, I would have had no idea that, that, that something was on my back. Right. Because, you know, I, I can't see back there. So, uh, Anyway, that those are going to be cut out. And then the, the one, the big one issue is going to be uh, radiation. I just, it's just, it's just hard to be doing uh, live TV, uh, and keeping the schedule. I can deal with the pain. I can deal with all the, you know, the, the, the things that are just in, in, in uh, what the word I'm looking for just inconvenient shit. I can deal with that, but, uh, I, I don't want to miss work. We're coming into a very important time of, for uh, AEW. We're big pay-per-views coming up in Minneapolis soon. And, and then the TV battle down, we're back on Wednesday nights. So we're not preempted anymore by baseball or NBA or what have you. So we're back on Wednesday. So we got a chance to re, re, uh, gather our audience. And, 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 in, and even saying that, you know, it's not like the, the bottom fell out of our ratings. Uh, we're still doing very good ratings but I don't live and die by the ratings. Like a lot of people do. I live and die by us having good shows. If we have good yep. shows, I figure everything's going to take care of itself. I agree. So, you know, and I'm at this stage of my life, I promise you it's not, uh, uh, there's more important things to worry about than the 18 to 49 demo, even though I get how important it is. I get that's how, uh, rights fees are set and things of that nature. But, but, uh, for, for, I can't, here's the deal. You're, if you can find yourself in your life or you can cut loose from things you can't control, you're better off for it. Totally agree. Better off for it. Don't spend a lot of your time and a lot of your brain cells and all that and get your computer running up there, uh, when, uh, when it's not necessary. So that's kind of where I'm here on this deal. So it's, uh, but the CPAP is imperative. It's the easiest that that's a deal where you go get a sleep test and you say, all you do is sleep. He's not giving blood. You're not doing anything stupid. And I guarantee you, some of you guys ask your wives, your significant others, whatever the case may be, if you stop breathing during the night and, and most of them are going to tell you, yes, because they hear it, they hear you gasping for air. And that's the way to the, that's the way to the, to the, to the, to the, uh, to the, to the funeral home. I, I, I so anyway, I, I'm a big, I, a lot of the guys in WWE back when I was there when I started, when I got diagnosed and, and I, I shared that information with a lot of guys, I'm not going to say who they are to, not to bre breach their privacy, but there's a lot of big stars that have been and are a WWE that has sleep uh, disorders. It's a common thing now. And, and it's, it's one of those deals that will kill you eventually. 
you know, I told the story about Reggie White, the great football player that played for the Packers and the Eagles, one of the greatest defensive linemen of all time. I went to Knoxville one time to do a feature with him. I think it was around WrestleMania 10. And uh, he had a great big old ugly CPAP machine on his nightstand. So I said, hey, Reg, what's that thing? And he, she, and his wife spoke up, said, that's, that's the, that's his machine. He won't wear because he thinks it makes you look like a sissy. And he kind of got embarrassed and, but Reggie died of sleep apnea. He had a heart attack in his sleep. That's what happens. Your heart is clenching so hard to breathe and to get a oxygen in your, in your, in your body that it, it finally, that muscle just gives out. So, uh, and that's what happened. I, I always think this is a terrible thing, but when somebody says so-and-so died in their sleep, I said, aha, sleep apnea. That's my thought process. So I travel with it on the road. And I think, you know, if you don't have, a, you have a, hadn't had a sleep test, you should think about it. You make a, do a drive-by for your, to your dermatologist, make sure that you don't have any spots on you that they can't, they can take a lot of those things off right there, right then. Nothing. So, uh, that's kind of, I've always championed that. And I think the older I get, the more I'm aware of my mortality and I'm more aware of the fact that I can't live, I won't, can't live forever, but I'm going to try to live really good while I'm here. And I'm going to try to be smarter about what I, how I protect myself there, you know, so a little, little, a little advice from somebody that's traveled that road. And I just want to see everybody healthy. And the sad part about it is Conrad, we we're, we're in the, in the spot where we can be healthier if we just take care of ourselves and go to the doctor and get advice and follow that advice. And, uh, my God, the sleep test is easy. And quite frankly, it's not, it's almost as easy as the skin test. They're just looking at you. They see blemishes. They, they zap them out. So something to think about, not as much fun as what we're going to talk about today, but nonetheless, uh, other th things are good. We're good. We're, we're really a major step closer getting the, uh, Red ass JR's hot sauce done. I'm, I'm a matter of fact, I'm proving, uh, approving the label today as we record this. So, uh, <clears throat> my goal, our goal, Stephen Link, my goal, or JR's black, uh, JR's barbecue.com is to have that sauce or that's that, uh, hot sauce ready for the holiday season, which is now. So hopefully within the next uh, week or so, you're going to get a big announcement for that and we can start shipping uh, red ash JR's hot sauce and I'll package it with some other things and it'll be sold individually as well. But I can promise you, if you want hot sauce, this stuff is hot and it is flavorful. So we'll see how it works out. It's a, um, it's a fun project. It's a vanity thing for me. So I even enjoy down, doing it. Even down to the name though, tell everybody what the name of the sauce is again. JR's red ass hot sauce. It's a great name. <laughs> It's such a great name. Yeah, I think so. So, uh, it's funny how everything ties back together, Conrad, and our, and our ventures, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, if I wasn't doing this podcast, I don't know if it'd be such a thing as red ass JR hot sauce. I don't know. Cause I, I, I thought of it, that, but we got, that became a thing here on the show. Uh, when I go on a little rant or a little pissed off or something. Uh, so anyway, it's, uh, it's going to be fun. And I've been, people have asked me about this stuff, the hot sauce for years. So now it's time to roll her out and see where it goes. Well, we're excited for it. Uh, a lot of new fun stuff coming down the pike between black hat farms and the hot sauce. Stay tuned. JR's BBQ.com. But at least for now, we feel like we should jump into what we're talking about today. It's uh, 25 years ago. The night Brian Pillman pulled a gun on Stone Cold Steve Austin on Monday Night Raw. Arguably, what year, what year was that, Connie? It was November fourth, nineteen ninety six. Uh huh. So as people are listening to this, it was exactly twenty five years ago today. Awesome. It, uh, such a long time ago, but on the other hand, it doesn't feel like it. No, no, I remember it this angle so well. Do you think this is maybe one of the most dramatic scenes ever done in professional wrestling? Oh yeah. It was way over the top dramatic, whatever way you want to put it. Uh, when it was done, I, I don't, I don't know where I'm not on the show. I don't think, uh, 96, I was there. You're, you're fresh I, off of the whole fake diesel. I mean, they're still hanging around, but you're, yeah. this is when you're doing sort of the heel thing and walking off on commentary and throwing your headset. Cause it doesn't work all that jazz. Oh, uh, well, that was sort of lightning. Uh, I never was high on this angle. 
I just thought it was unrealistic. Uh, and when uh, if Austin had gone to Brian's house without a, and Brian didn't have a gun, I probably would have had a different feel for this. It just, the gun took me out of, uh, any sense of reality based, uh, you know, cause you got, now you got cameras there and you got Kevin Kelly out there and you got, you know, Brian's wife there and you know, all the camera technical people and a guy waving a gun. It just didn't make sense to me, but you know, I was in a position at that time to voice my displeasure to any degree. That's what Vince wanted to do. So that's what we did. And I'm not sure who came up with the idea. It's going to be interesting when you think about that. I, I know Vince had liked stuff like that. And that was the first, to me, this show we're going to do today was the first major step uh, into the entertainment side of sports entertainment, the drama of the gun and all this breaking in the screams and all, all this stuff, uh, certainly, uh, was unique, but unbelievable. But maybe that's pro wrestling. I don't know. But nonetheless, it will it'll play out. And it's quite the it's produced well episodically, segment by segment, but nonetheless, uh it was uh hard to hard to like for me. And as a result of that, I never have se- I've never seen this footage ever. Really? You never sat down and watched it? Nope. Wow. Just I, I just it just didn't push the right buttons. Yeah. I'm not going to complain about all the creative and you know, all this, this shits and then I should have done that. I should have, I'm not, I'm not going there, but I, I'm just saying that for me and my personal taste, it was somewhat unrealistic and I never lost. I never found myself lost in that story on this episode. Now, others that haven't seen it before may say that's pretty cool. I don't know. That's what we're going to, we're going to find that out. But nonetheless, it's a, uh, it was an interesting day at work and. And I'm trying to think what I was doing, I was doing something. You're, you do an in-ring interview with Sid and Sean. I'm sure you do a lot more, but on the television show, you do like an in-ring interview on this one. Okay. Well, I was carrying the clipboard around and uh, the visor on the sidelines, just looking, no I'm kidding. <laughs> it, it, yeah, it, was, it well, but anyway, I'm looking forward to seeing it because again, it was a big part of what was going on. Uh, you know, we're, we're we were chasing, we were going down the wrong road anyway, Conrad, uh, because Brian was never going to be able to fulfill the, 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 his end of the angle. He had an ankle fused. So the angle was going to be hard to cu- culminate with Brian because Brian couldn't wrestle. So there again, and I'm dealing with all this and Brian's, you know, friend and, you know, I've supported him forever. Uh, but it just didn't, how are we going to pay this off? Right. That was a question. So maybe we'll, maybe we can ascertain that as we, uh, go, go down this road. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I can't believe this is real, but we not only got a handicapper, but we got the best ever. How are you so good at handicapping these games? I mean, four and oh, that's quite a streak already. Well, uh, you know, let's talk about every pick I've given this year in the NFL, as an example, 23 and eight. Every pick I've given this year, four weeks in the bag, 23 and eight. There's nobody in the country that can match what I do, but I always make sure because anybody, Conrad, could make up anything. They could tell you and blow smoke and tell you, oh, I'm the greatest. But I am independently monitored and documented, so nobody could ever question what I say and go, I don't believe it. I send every pick to an independent monitoring and documentation service that has to get the pick before the game goes off and then publishes it after the game goes off. So anybody could see what I gave, but this is the best start I've ever had. I've never been this good to start a season. You don't win every week, four weeks in a row, everything you put out. It's been the kind of year I've had. So get on a hot streak. Cause when a guy's on a hot streak, like me, you want to ride it. I've always had a talent for picking winners, never quite as hot as I am right now, but I've always been very good at it. And, and I think it's because I do more homework than anybody else. You know, the average guy or gal watching this podcast, they, they don't have time. They have a career. They have jobs. They, they might read the newspaper or go online and see something, but they don't have time 80 hours a week to study the games. That's what I do. And I have a crew of guys behind me, my consultants, who every week we get together three times a week and they throw their ideas at me. I throw my ideas at them. 
And then I picked the final five plays on Saturday and Sunday in college and pro football. So, I mean, I've got a great team behind me too, but it's, we're all doing together hundreds of hours of homework. So you don't have to, it's all at vegaswinners.com. I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to vegaswinners.com right now. Let's win some money. It's going to be a fun episode. We're going to do it. Watch along style. We're not ready just yet, but go ahead and pull it up. It's from November 4th, 1996. Uh, and I believe it's uh, season four, episode 43, 49 minute and eight second episode on Peacock season four, episode 43 from November 4th, 1996. Before we get into it, let's sort of set the stage. We're two weeks removed from Bret Hart announcing his return to the ring, which we covered last month. And now in between time, well, some news. First off, let's discuss that, uh, in between Bret Hart challenging Steve Austin to survivor series, there was the superstars that airs, which would show an in-ring interview with Brian Pillman holding the uh, microphone for Steve Austin and the Bret Hart interview would air live on October 21st. So that superstars episode that we're talking about was literally taped the next night, October 22nd, and it's going to air on the 27th. And that's going to be in a town that's near and dear to Brian's heart, Cincinnati, Ohio. But let's talk about the superstars taping Were Steve and, and, and Brian excited to be working together again. I mean, obviously we saw him as a, a tag team that was a real fan favorite over in WCW, the Hollywood blondes. Now they've, they've changed addresses. They're here with the world wrestling federation. So we got that knowing glance back at King of the ring where they just pass each other in the aisleway. but now, Hey, we're finally going to do a superstars taping together. And of course we know that's going to end with Steve Austin attacking the, the shattered ankle or shattering the reconstructed ankle of Brian Pillman. Were they excited to be mixing it up again and working with each other again? I think they were excited to be able to contribute to the creative and create a story around those two. Uh, again, to the best degree that it can be done, but yeah, I think they're both, uh, they, they, they hope to be fun, obviously, but they, they loved each other so much. Those two guys are, they're, they're just great. They fed off each other. They fed each other's creativity and each other's passion. So I would say, yes, absolutely. They were excited about the opportunity and I'm not so sure they were how much planning they had in, uh, the creative, but knowing Austin and knowing Brian, as I did do and did, uh, they're going to contribute to the creative to some degree. So I, I uh, it, it was fun to watch them brainstorm and, and get to where they were going to go. But again, you know, the audience here is going to be the judge of, well, that was pretty good or eh, not so much. I want to mention, um, the way that angle really got kicked off. Uh, last month when we watched Brett announcing that he was coming back to the WWF, we got a backstage look at Steve Austin watching on a monitor. And when Brett officially announced Pillman sort of clapped and cheered in celebration. And now we're going to have a big confrontation here on superstars uh, at the taping the very next day, where Brian Pillman is going to have to answer to that to yeah. Shawn Michaels. And we're going to play a little audio from that. And, uh, this is directly from superstars and this aired on October 27th. So it would have been, uh, the week before what we're about to see on Monday night Raw. I'll take a listen. Well, this should be a most interesting uh, interview. I know that Austin's got a lot to say about the return of Brett and the Hitman Hart. The man that Austin will meet November the 17th in Madison square garden at the survivor series. Tell me a little bit about doing commentary on these superstar shows. Did you enjoy that? How would you compare that to doing a Monday night raw in this era? Well, mindset wise, it was, uh, the same because we did live to tape. So there, there, there was a net there in case you really screwed up. And, uh, as I've been known to do from time to time in recent years or so I'm told, uh, let's take I, a listen to Brian Pillman here. We've been friends a long time. I probably know you better than anybody else. That's why I know how excited you must be with the announcement live on Raw that Bret Hart is going to come out of this semi-retirement and answer your challenge at Survivor Series. It's finally going to be your chance to prove yourself. 
I sure as hell saw how excited you were when you jumped out of your chair like some kind of cheerleader. Don't even start talking yet, because I ain't through, son. Then you went out there and you shook his hand. It ain't time to start kissing up to Bret Hart yet, because he ain't yet lived up to the biggest challenge of his life. And shut up. I ain't never had to prove myself to nobody. Now, Steve, I know how frustrated you are. I know the disappointment you've had throughout your career. It's understandable. A little bit hot on me. I got caught up in the moment. Very emotional. I was excited that I was going to finally get to see you answer a lifelong dream at Survivor Series in the city that never sleeps, the most famous arena in the world, Madison Square Garden. And you can listen to me, you little crippled freak. Hey, come on. Everybody knows that at one time, I carried you to a world championship. Everybody knows at one time, you rode in my back pocket. Wow. Madison Square Garden, Bret Hart, you're gonna find out Bret Hart's going to find out. The whole damn world's going to find out. I will do exactly what I say. I am going to whip his ass. Well, there you have it. Austin versus the best there was, the best there is, and the best there was. Hey, wait a minute. Oh, wow. What a cheap shot. Oh, by Austin didn't want to hear that. Austin with a cheap shot on Brian Pillman. Pillman is just getting assaulted here by Austin. Austin stomping away at the cripple Brian Pillman. Oh, no. Austin just broke that key right across Pillman's ankle. And now he's Austin stomping away. Austin may have, he may have re-broken Pillman's ankle here. Well, you got to respect Stone Cold Steve Austin. Look at this guy. That's uh, Mr. Perfect, by the way. Everybody's wondering. I don't care who he is. He can't defend himself. I don't care. Get out of wrestling if you can't defend yourself. It's the World Wrestling Federation. Either shut up or put up or do something. Austin's like a, an animal here. Oh, wait a minute. Pillman's ankle. Well, not hardly. Don't do it again. Don't do it. Gerald Briscoe. Oh, my God. Briscoe thrown outside. The WWF official hits the floor. Oh, this is. This, oh, my God. We got to be. But the damage has been done. William Pilma's athletic career. William just ended. So there you go. The big in-ring attack. I love the, uh, the pacing of that and the setup and that, and, and the explanation, um, you know, you sort of got a tease on raw and it's continued to superstars. And before you know it, we're going to see what we're going to see here tonight, which is, uh, I don't know, one of the more infamous moments of, of Monday night raw for sure. Mm. But I gotta say this promo in hindsight. That segment we just saw, even though it was on superstars and it's not exactly on raw, it's really one of the first major things we see with this stone cold character. Of course, we know he became Austin or created Austin three sixteen four months prior in June, but this promo to me really shapes the character of who stone cold Steve Austin is more than anything else we've seen yet in 96. Would you agree? Yeah, it's good. Uh, it is, it is, it set the boundaries as to who the character was, what he represents, who he is. And remember, Steve always just basically played, uh, himself, his real self amplified. So he wasn't working us as much as a lot of guys who play a character and they're perceived they're, 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 they're going through the motions as if they know what this character would say in reality. If you're playing a role and you're not a trained actor, sometimes that falls a little bit short, but Austin never did that. He was always himself. And so was Brian. And, uh, 
but yeah, you're right, Connie, on this thing. This was a real major step for Austin. It was on the number one syndicated show in in a in uh, AEW. See, there I go again. In WWE's, uh, uh, you know, in, in their in their in their roster, their lineup. It had more. It had a great exposure. It was on all the. If they had a one clearance in any market, it was superstars, and generally it was on a good station. So, uh, it got a lot of, it launched Steve pretty well. He and Brian, I think I'm sure Brian had a lot of, you know, Brian knew his in-ring stuff was going to be limited going forward, which killed him. It didn't do his psyche any good. Didn't do his, uh, outer ring behavior any good. He was just demolished, uh, after that accident in this Humvee. So, uh, I, I, Steve just, Steve was willing to give it a shot. And so was Brian and nobody knew exactly where it was going to go. My issue was never between these two guys. My issue was that we have to use a gun. Yeah. As we'll see. And, and, and again, the folks out there watching and listening can make that determination. Was it necessary? Did it add to it? Did it take away from it? That's all subjective. It's all some person's opinion. And so we'll all be able to make that decision on our own here momentarily. In hindsight. Do you remember how the conversation to involve a gun first came to be part of all this? I think Steve and, and Brian had a lot to do with, uh, the mechanics of this angle. And I I'm sure that the gun came up, you know, also as a gun guy, anyway, uh, Hunter and all that stuff. Uh, not so sure about Brian's uh, gun love. But, uh, I'm sure that those guys had a whole lot to do with it. And probably if they introduced the gun to Vince as an idea, Vince is going to be hard pressed to say no, mm. cause he kind of liked that sensationalistic stuff. He wanted the show to be more of a dramatic, uh, episodic presentation, uh, a step away from the traditional pro wrestling. And so that's what you got in the show. It, it was not traditional pro wrestling. But it was a dr dramatic performance involving pro wrestlers. And I think that's what Vince has been, that's what he was seeking all along. You know, he wanted to expand the roles of the characters so they would could do more than just a headlock or a stunner or whatever. So it was a uh, I'm sure Austin and Brian had 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 much to say about the input of the angle because that was their deal between the two of them. So I don't know how to what degree. But knowing those guys, as I do, uh, and I did Connie, I think that, uh, I would be remiss to say, oh, they didn't have anything to do with it because I didn't like the gun. Doesn't mean it's not a good idea. Again, folks may love it, but, uh, I knew that those two guys, they're going to work together. They're going to collaborate. And I think that's what they did here on this angle. It's around this time that you start to move into more of a, a talent relations role with JJ Dillon. Uh, moving on down to Atlanta. I'm curious from a, a Pillman standpoint, how on top of this, were you with him in terms of having conversations about where he was with his recovery and, and obviously the bad news that it's not as far along as we would have liked. And then we turn that into an angle. Would that have been something that would have primarily happened with JJ before you got the spot? Or is this something that's going to land on your watch? Probably not JJ. Uh, I mean, JJ did a great job there and I learned a lot from JJ in that role. Uh, when he abruptly left, I told that story, Bruce and I were in, uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. And, uh, it was the weekend of Shane McMahon's wedding and JJ bolted, uh, and, and all because right before that we'd all taken drastic pay cuts. This was not great. And the people that suffered first were the wrestling people. So I don't, I don't, my pay got cut like 50 grand or something. So it's significant, but I never forget Vince saying, if you stick with me, I'll make this all up to you. And he did. And in the form of stock and pay increases, but we just had to get the business up. We had to be more productive as a unit in, in the wrestling side. So, uh, it was, uh, but I talked to Brian probably multiple times a week. And normally it was him calling me. He just was bored and he was concerned. And Brian had a Brian internalized a lot of stuff. Brian's a very, very bright guy, high IQ. 
And sometimes you use that high IQ in a negative way about, you know, what am I going to do? And my, one of my roles was I, I wanted Brian to be a Jesse Ventura, a really a Roddy Piper, a heel broadcaster that understood the business that could be timely and creative and, and, uh, and, and add a little pop culture here, there, and yon. And because Brian was well, very well read and up on that kind of stuff. So that, that was basically the thing. It was basically talking him off the ledge, which is an ongoing process every week. Well, let's, uh, let's jump into it. We want you guys to uh, start this watch along with us. It's season four, episode 43, November 4th, 1996. We're going to encourage you to fire it up on your end, but press mute. And then, uh, my buddy Jr. and I. We'll try to entertain you with some alternate commentary. Jim, I'm ready on my end. Are you ready on your end? I think I am. Well, here we go. Season four, episode 43. I'm going to give a three second countdown and then say play and you'll press play. Here we go in three, two, one play. Wrestling Federation for over 50 years, the revolutionary force in sports entertainment. Last week, Stone Cold Steve Austin was live in our WWF studios, and Bret Hart joined us live via satellite from his home in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Never hear of equal time, McMahon. The producers tried to cut Stone Cold off. He took it out on everyone and everything in sight. From there, Steve Austin accosted the studio security guard, who had no choice but to call for police backup. And tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Kelly is standing by live via satellite from the home of Brian Pillman in suburban Cincinnati. Yeah, and guess who's coming to dinner? Stone Cold. Cole Steve Austin and can Shawn Michaels cross psycho Sid are the New York Jets going to the Super Bowl at Survivor Series Sid and Shawn will go at each other head to head next week they'll be side by side in tag competition but tonight first they'll go face to face right here on Monday Night Raw nice little open I I'm nostalgic about this old open yeah I liked it it, it catch a chef with a story I think every episodic television show needs some sort of uh, recap. Bring me up to speed. Bring me up, update me. I may have missed last week. There's I love Kevin. the open, the music, the whole deal. And here's Kevin Kelly. King, you're all red ring side, but right now, let's take you to Kevin. Biggest assignment of his life. Of Brian Feldman's home. Kevin, go ahead. Can you hear us? Coming to you from suburban Cincinnati live outside the home of Brian Pillman. I'm Kevin Kelly. Where in just a few moments, I'll be conducting a very special live interview with Brian Pillman. Now, this uh, uh, remember that this interview was announced last week on Raw. And in the wake of the announcement, Stone Cold Steve Austin threatened to show up here tonight live at Brian Pillman's home in suburban Cincinnati. Now, Mr. Pillman is here with his wife. His children have been sent to their grandparents in the wake of this threat. Now, you can understand Mr. Pillman. He's very tense. He's inside, immobile, and fe feeling very vulnerable. It's a high-tense situation. What will Brian Pillman do? If Stone Cold Steve Austin follows up with his threat and shows up here tonight live, I will ask him that question as well as the prognosis for his recovery in just a few moments live. All right, thank you very much, Kevin Kelly. And here we go, ladies and gentlemen. Here we go with some action. Yeah, Monday Night Raw. And so there you go, Kevin Kelly. It feels like that piece of the show would have been done live, uh, what we just saw. Do you remember anything about that shoot itself? Was that really Brian Pillman's house? Yeah, I think it was. And I think, uh, that was a, that Kevin's, uh, piece of business there was pre-taped and, and, and the reason for that was just to get the, the timing of the show, mm -hmm. time the show correctly. Cause it had, there're going to be a lot of installments from Brian Pillman's, uh, uh, home. Here comes uh, Goldust and Marlena. I thought they were a great act. I, I agree. It was an entertaining, uh, concept. And the duo was great. And obviously both did their jobs really well, but such a departure from the natural dust and roast of this. And he pulled it off and it's a shame that Meltzer looks back at this. And I don't think he really appreciated the gold dust stuff. Uh, and now we see Mr. Perfect coming to the ring and there's crush. What an interesting time. The fall of 1996 is, you know, to add context on the other channel, we just had Halloween havoc, 1996. Crow sting is now a thing. There's no longer a surfer sting. Roddy Piper has just shown back up. He's involved in wrestling after coming out for the main event 
of Hulk Hogan and uh, the Macho Man Randy Savage at Havoc '96. But the NWO angle is just gangbusters. And now here on this side of things, obviously we're trying to level up our attitude and look in the bottom right hand corner. It's Mark Henry and the debut of a blue chipper. Let's take a listen. On right here tonight. And here comes the stalker. And the names just keep coming. Now it's the stalker and Mark Miro, uh, walk into the ring here. This, this is an interesting time fall of 1996. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Yeah, it was, you know, you, you, it's, it gets frustrating sometimes when you're all we're doing is, uh, repackaging the same, Yeah. you know, uh, and we needed new, you got, now you got some new in this group here, uh, here we go. We start the fight, but, uh, uh, Barry and, and Goldust have known each other since uh, Goldust was born. Uh, and they had good chemistry. They liked each other. You know, dusty was their link. But, uh, the rock and Mark Henry would, would go on to be two of the biggest stars the company ever produced. And certainly rocks, not in the hall of fame, but not because of any reason other than, you know, it's just not, he hasn't decided to go in. Let's listen to do do here. Austin, he says he's in the rent a car has left the Cincinnati airport is headed to Brian Pillman's and he wants to talk to you, Vinny Mac. <laughs> Did you have him on the Am phone? I on the air? Yes, you are. Steve, yeah. Steve Austin. Yeah. Are you actually in the car on the way to Mr. Pillman's house? Yeah, right. I said I was going to be last week, and anything I say comes true, Vince. Yeah. You know that. I'm the biggest star in the world, so who's going to stop me? <laughs> what are your intentions? I don't understand. Why Why are you going to Brian Pillman's house? Hey, he's the one that brought this whole mess on. He took my interview time, tried to turn it into a shrine to worship, rest the hit man heart. And inspired a new verse out of the book of Austin. Austin 2517. I will strike down upon your ass with great vengeance and furious anger, and that's what's gonna happen. Mr. Austin, I must warn you, there is a welcoming committee there. Ryan Pillman has his friends around that house. It is not wise for you to go there. And I got a six-pack of whoop ass riding shotgun with me, son. Remember, don't intimidate me in the least bit. If I got something to do, then it's going to get done. Stone Cold, Stone Cold, listen what? to King. Listen, that idiot Pillman threatened last week, said he's going to have a gun there. All right, knock it off. Well, he yeah, said he that. got the guts. What? I'll do whatever it takes to get my hands on Pillman. You'll find out. Mr. Austin, we're what? talking about trespass here. We're not talking about something in the rustling world we're talking about trespass if you make good on your promise well listen Vince if something happens to me I'm sure you'll make amends for it because I'm a big star I'm in the big matches survivor series you can't do without me I can do whatever I want and I've got the mindset and I've ticked off enough and I don't really give a rat that I will do what I say regardless of the consequences Steve Austin apparently on his way to Brian Pillman's home. And imagine Brian Pillman is sitting, ladies and gentlemen, Whoa. with his wife, Melanie, at home in Cincinnati, watching this. Knowing hey, hey, look at him, man. So how about that? We get a little tease of, of what's to come. Yeah. We're only seven minutes into the show. This is really the coming out party for this stone cold character. All of this angle. Yeah. We've completely ignored, uh, Barry Wyndham and, uh, Goldust. As did the broadcast, so uh, it was a big deal. It was the the, the main. It was the, it was the thing, and uh, it, I like the way you framed that, Conrad. But Austin's coming out party. Now those Lawler, you know Lawler's going to gravitate toward Marlena for some unknown reason. It's weird. I can think of, I can think of a couple of reasons, but nonetheless, Lawler's such a good heel. This is in the era where he was a heel. Yes. And when he and I got together, the, the comfort level, I think the audience had, we, we just became the voices of their childhood type thing. As we, I hear that a lot. And so consequently, uh, he was, he and I then were, look at this. Uh, first time I saw a man kiss another man in a wrestling ring was Adrian streak back in the day with Terry Taylor. They're yep. actually having a, they're actually having a pretty good match, but uh, in any event, uh, hey, a two segment match too. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, both those guys were great workers. You knew you get quality time out of it. Look at Stone Cold again. Because you lost to Shawn Michaels. The pretty boy. The boy toy. Kicked your ass back to Canada. You couldn't face yourself and you can't face your family. You ran away in shame. Another time to come I back, son. No sexy when the boy, bell rings man. and it's time to get down to business, I dance, I'm going to take seven years of frustration and being pissed off out on your ass. Think about it like this, Brett. You can finally go home, look yourself in the mirror, and get a little peace of mind because you will know you were indeed beat by a real man. You know, one of the amazing things about that, all that Austin stuff was that it was all, uh, extemporaneous. There was no script. Yep. There was no memor memorizing your lines, uh, or having some kid, uh, with pimples on her face, come tell you how you should act as a man or in a, in a situation like this, but all that talent outside the ring, man, triple H Lawler, perfect. And of course the great one. Oh, and crushing Mark Henry and Mark Merrow and yeah. Mike Kyoto. And I mean, it is just a, it was a walking, talking hall of fame around the squared circle here. Well, we knew we had the pe the pieces Conrad, they just need to be joined together with some sort of symmetry that makes some sense. And of course, uh, Mark Henry, I think he had his first big match with Lawler. Uh, Mark was still learning. We sent Mark up to Calgary to work with, uh, Brett and his crew. Cause we knew you don't get guys that weigh 400 pounds that can dunk a basketball and, and not take all the time you need that or that you can uh, create quite frankly, to help them out. Man, how about Mark? How about, uh, the flying cross body from the rock there? Yeah. I don't, you don't see that one too much. <laughs> What a nice way to build a survivor series too. just show all the guy, let it break down and let all the guys wind up going at it here. All are directing traffic out there, which he's very good at. Yeah. This, uh, this is a very, uh, amazing array of talent. There's, uh, uh, Mr. Mason, Clarence Mason named after Clarence Darrow and Perry Mason, believe it or not. Triple H in his, uh, his Greenwich gear. Yeah, the original Hunter Hearst Helmsley look. Here we go. My goodness. With his beautiful wife, Melanie, and talk all about what's going on here. Yes, indeed. Stand by right now. Let's take it live to Doc. Doc, what about this year, Milton Brad? So now, of course, uh, Doc Hendricks is going to break down the Karate Fighters Survivor Series card. Survivor Series 96, I think, is maybe one of the best forgotten pay-per-views, uh, but you get an incredible match with, with Sid and Sean. I think it might be the best match of Sid's career. If not one, certainly two, and then an unbelievable match with Austin and, uh, and Bret Hart. And now you see here, they're teasing mankind and the undertaker. This is the one where the undertaker descended down from the rafters with like bat wings and those tattoo looking teardrops on his face. Really a pretty special episode of survivor series. Yeah. And, and, and no better place than the garden. Obviously it was loaded. The card was loaded. Here we go. Take all you've done with your vicious lies. This makes me angry. So you've got to accept the fact that at survivor series, you will wish that you had stayed very alive. Yeah, this card's loaded. You see the other person in the ring is the executioner, which we know is actually Terry Gordy. And all right, they're lowering down from the ceiling as the lights flicker. The reports of my demise were greatly exaggerated. I thought I would take this time to preview to you, your future. At Survivor Series, Paul Bearer, this 
is what I have in store for you. That's a pretty good graphic. <laughs> so we've got uh, the old shark cage lowered down with uh, a, a Paul Bear dummy hung upside down. How about that? It's a pretty good visual. You know, another thing we talk about star power, talented people, a lot of areas. Michael Hayes is certainly fits in that category as well. Great pitch man, great talker. Back to Pillman's house in Cincinnati with Brian Pillman, along with Kevin Kelly. And of course, everyone knows of the injury sustained rather uh, at the well, WWF Superstructs about a week ago. And uh, Kevin, would you uh, proceed with the interview? Yes, uh, Vince, it's a very tense scene here in suburban Cincinnati tonight. Brian, I have to ask you, after the unprovoked savage attack last week on WWF Superstars, you had I understand reconstructive surgery once again on your ankle. Can you give us the prognosis? What have the doctors told you about your recovery? Look, Kelly, I'm alive and well. I got an excellent prognosis for 97. But let's talk about Mr. Austin's prognosis. I've been in bitter feuds many, many times in this sport. There's a fine line between business and private lives. Austin, you've crossed that line. You've made this personal. But now we're operating on a whole different set of rules, so. And Brian, we heard earlier that uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin could be on his way to your home here tonight. Uh, I you actually, can't move. Kev, if I can inter interject this, uh, I have so I'm told that uh, in fact that we have uh, Mr. Austin circling the neighborhood, and I just wonder oh. whether or not, from your standpoint, uh, Mr. Pillman, if you can hear me, it seems to me that considering your vulnerability with your wife Melanie. And with, well, Steve Austin's very vulnerable as well. Well, well not what do you his feel like? His rage has blinded him to the fact that his best friend knows him better than anybody. Do you feel it? His strengths, his weaknesses, and certainly his fears. Notwithstanding your bravado, do you feel a hostage? You feel like you're a hostage in your own home tonight? Ah, Steve is a dead man walking because when Austin 316 meets Pillman. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. I'm going to blast God. his he's service. He's out there to hell. He's just, Steve Austin's out there now. Man. What? And then we go to commercial. Yeah. We come back from the commercial and it's a karate fighter segment, Jim. Yeah. On, on that one, I'm going to go to the bathroom. <laughs> All right, so we're at sixteen twenty-eight, and I'll count us in. All right, and three, two, one, play. So how about that, man? Back to back, the the gun segment, and then a karate fighters plug. Nineteen ninety-six, man. That's it. Well, that was a big sponsor, and they were paying a lot of money for that time. They did. The, they bought the time. They bought the vignettes, it's like the stuff here we're seeing with the. Todd Pettengale, look at his hair. It would never move. It would move in a hurricane. The, um, the line about Austin 316 meaning Pillman nine millimeter. That's probably not. I mean, do you think that's scripted or is that just the guys freestyling? Oh, I think everything they did was freestyling. Hmm. The, uh, the build for this and what we're the visual right now of, of Sid and Marlena playing karate fighters. And by the way, from an advertising standpoint, let's just say, look at the value that they got for this Milton Bradley. I mean, I mean, here we are 25 years later, and this is still inside the show. If this would have been inside of a regular commercial break, instead of a stop set. Well, we would never see it. Oh, and we're back, and there's a brawl outside of Pillman's house. Let's listen. You're not Stone Cold Steve Austin. We had heard that Austin had arrived on the scene as we left you for break. Stone Cold Steve Austin's out there with Brian Pillman's friends, and Pillman's friends are trying to keep Austin away. Look at this. The shots are live. Steve Austin. See, these are all done in one take, Conrad. Look at this. Look 
Steve Austin on the outside of Brian Pillman's home. Oh. This might be a little long. Just saying. Yeah, I mean, and especially with the piped in audio, the piped in audio is a little weird. Ryan Pillman on the inside of his house with his wife, Melanie, are watching these pictures as we are live. Austin is outside of Brian Pillman's home. I know you're out there, Brian. So we see Steve Austin stomping around from the driveway around to the front door. He stunt. Austin trying to get into the house of Brian Pillman. And lo and behold, the door's locked. Which is probably a good idea if you're told that someone's <laughs> yeah. coming to beat you up. I think so. He's disappeared around the corner. And we're back on back in. So I should mention the uh, the folks that Steve Austin was beating up there. There are a couple of Les Thatcher students. Yeah. And I like the idea that that didn't feel overproduced. You know, it, it wasn't lit very well. It didn't have big production value. It didn't look like a movie. Right. It looked more like an episode of cops, right? Yeah, absolutely. And my only uh, suggestion would be, it could have probably been done a little bit shorter. Uh, maybe it, draw, it was drawn out a little bit too long. Uh, but that was a small critique if, if any, but yeah, it looked more real. Like I said, I didn't have any issues with this, uh, angle until we start getting gunplay involved. There's crazy old Bob Backlund. And how crazy is this too, by the way, you know, here we are having a segment where there's a gun. And when we come back from commercial, it's the karate fighters. And then we go to that violent scene outside of Pillman's house where he's beating up Les Thatcher students and trying to basically break into their house. And then we come back to the arena. And here comes the Sultan walking out with some red smoke and the over the top Bob Backlund character doing some mic work for him. Of course, we know eventually this is going to become Rikishi and he's going to become a megastar. But this persona here, uh, maybe not so much as we see. Well, we're looking, you know, we're just trying to find something to use it. You know, uh, Rikishi had a, had a great skill set, big athletics, smart to the business. Uh, he, he was 300 plus good feet of comeback all those things, but, uh, you know, we, what what we're going to do with him and Vince had decided at at that time, ironically, how it is today, we had decided at that time to, to, to move away from the Samoan gangs, the Samoan groups. So, and we, everybody loved working with, uh, Rikishi with junior just had to find something for him to do. So we see the iron cheek and, um, his little ceremonial pre-match, the prayer, the prayer rug. Yeah. First time I saw that was general Skandar Akbar. How do you think that played in Louisiana? <laughs> Probably made him a heel. If I had to go, uh, I would, you think you're correct. You're onto something. So there's a great Timmy coach. white. And there's a referee, my old friend, Timmy white owner of the friendly tap. What do you got for us on, uh, Alex Porto, anything? He was just a, a young kid that I think he might've been an Akbar guy. Matter of fact, uh, Alex was a indie kid had good reputation there. He, for all you guys listening to work in the Indies, you know, you can build your reputation there as in being on time and being cooperative and being in shape, and being prepared to steal the show, no matter if you win or lose. Alex is a hardworking kid. Took a good ass whipping, as we're seeing here. And the town looks like working with him because he was he knew where to be and when to be there. Notice he's the cell cell job is really important. The um 
the show is really this thread the whole way through of what's happening at Pillman's house. Right. Um, what do you, what do you think of that? Is that necessary in, in modern wrestling to have like an A thread and a B thread or what have you something that, you know, keeps the person start, you know, from start to finish this one primary angle. Yeah. I, I think for continuity sake, creative continuity, you need to have a, uh, you know, a destination, you need to have a, 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 a route, uh, you know, it just makes sense. It's, it's essential part of the storytelling to have a common thread. And, uh, there's a Rikishi under the hood, so to speak. And, uh, he, he wins by submission. Alex Porto did his job the way it was lined out to be. It was kind of fun to send the iron Sheik back. He was always a great character in the locker room. I've known Cosgrove since he was Cosgrove Viserri and he weighed about 180. He used to travel with Danny Hodge back in McGurk's territory. Here we go. Stone Cold Steve Austin outside. He's been making his way around all the way to the back of the house, screaming and yelling. Pillman's got this pistol out, and I don't know what the hell is going on here. This is ridiculous. Pillman's got this. Oh, what the? What the hell is that? Somebody call the police. That's Austin. Get out of there. Don't go in there. Don't go in there. This is where they lost me. So the, the feed was cut and we come back for a commercial. Exactly. All we have, we have, we have no idea what's going on in, in Brian Pillman's house. We have, we have no idea. This is all we have. This is what we've had for the last three minutes. And Jim Ross in the ring has no idea what's going on. No <laughs> what do you say? Jim Ross has no idea what he's doing. <laughs> and as soon as we have any word whatsoever, we will interrupt this and take you back to Cincinnati. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the man that will challenge Shawn Michaels for the World Wrestling Federation Championship at the Survivor Series, Psycho Sid. And I dare say that. What did, uh, we're going to talk about the gun angle a lot, but we're seeing Sid come to the ring here after your big introduction. What did Vince think of Sid here in 96? We loved him. Loved him. Loved the look. Loved his image. And, uh, for whatever reason, I don't say that in a negative vent, uh, the crowd, you can see reaching out to get high fives. And when, when Sid started fist bumping as silly as it may sound, it, 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 all that was, was symbolically a link between the intended heel at one point, the big monster heel, Sid vicious and the audience. So he, he kind of inadvertently turned baby face. And again, we're, we're, we're on the cusp of this defiant era. That's why Austin got over. I, I think, you know, he was anti establishment. He was different. He wasn't a Ricky steamboat, Ricky Morton, like baby face. And neither is Sid, obviously. That's probably one of the last times you see Sid get through the go in the ring through the second, third rope. He generally sits over the top. The old Andre thing. And of course, now you're introducing Shawn Michaels. We've got a couple of podiums set up almost debate style here in the ring. And Shawn Michaels is our world champion. And this is going to be our main event of survivor series. What type of job do you think Shawn did here in 96 with his run as champ from WrestleMania to survivor series? He did good. You know, he did. He, look, he never had a bad match that I can remember. I can just say this. I never called a bad match. And he's got the great Jose Lothario, who was a really a, a good man, hell of a talent. He was one of Cowboy Bill Watts favorite guys. Jose was always there on time, did his job, worked hard. And of course, uh, Sean had the fire row, had his act down, had the music, had the look, and he has the title for now. Let's take a listen. So what's, uh, what's being said here? You conjecture, obviously you're concerned with notwithstanding ladies and gentlemen, the fact Brian that Pillman. these two men and will be tag team partners right here next week on raw when they challenge for the world wrestling federation tag team championship. 
we turn our attention to November the 17th. Madison Square Garden will be the site, the Survivor Series, the event, World Wrestling Federation title on the line. And Sean, I've got to start with you, please. After receiving multiple power bombs right here on Raw a little over a year ago from Sid, have you forgiven this man? I think that I made it perfectly clear to Sid and the fans of the World Wrestling Federation that yes, I forgave him. I'm the one that went to where he was, the loony bin, and got him out of there and brought him back to the World Wrestling Federation because Sid is still my buddy. One way or another. Well, Sid, uh, do you appreciate Shawn Michaels calling you crazy or insane? He inferred that loony man. First of all, that's bullshit. Now, if you're stupid enough to believe I walked my ass out of a loony bin into the World Wrestling Federation, then you can be just that stupid. You know something, Sid? You may not like it. You know as well as I do where you were and who you have to thank for being back in the World Wrestling Federation. You're not the first, Sid, and you probably won't be the last. Well, uh, you know, I don't know how you guys are going to coexist next week in that tag team matchup, but Sid, why did you hit Sean from behind? First of all, I did not hit Sean from behind. It was a mistake, and I told him that, and I told you that, fat soul. But I'll tell you something. Hey. He can take it any way he wants to take it. I should whip your ass right now, but I can't. <laughs> Sid made a mistake, like he said. He apologized. I got news for you. Sid and I understand our relationship. He apologized. I accepted it. It's done. But in Survivor We're Series, returning now, ladies and gentlemen, to Cincinnati, Cincinnati where we have no reestablished our live satellite feed. Hard way. And Sid wants a part of me as no. much as I want a part of him. Sorry, we don't have and it. Survivor Series, it's going to happen. Sid... You're going to go down at the hand of the heartbreak kid. I've beaten you once. I'm going to beat you again, Sid. Well, Sid, many people think that you're the favorite in this matchup because of your huge size advantage. Do you feel that way? Do you feel that you are the favorite going into the Survivor Series against the champion? Listen to Ross feel the well, fire. Well, I think Jimmy the Greek would even look at me and say, yeah, he's the favorite, not just because his size, but because of his ability. It's your ability that is going to be your downfall, Sid. It is today, it will be tomorrow, and it is going to be at Survivor Series. Buddy, whether you like it or not, you're not in my league. That's right. I'm not in the little league, little man, because I am the man. To be the man, as the saying goes, you got to beat the man. That belt is on this Ooh. side. And that's where it's staying with you, like it or not. Right. And size has got nothing to do with it. I knocked you down before. I knocked you down again. Well, oh, it's the Barber Series, little man. That belt will be around my waist. Man. And I guarantee it. I smell You're another the situation. Get out of hand. Hey, oh. hey, 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 hey. Look at this. And the, the tempers are. Jose, you get out of my way. To flare. No, you, no, no, no. Don't tell me. Just get Sister out of my way. Don't put, Jose. Hey. You want to push a 60 year old man, tough guy, go right ahead. Try pushing somebody half his age. Try pushing the World Wrestling Federation champion, Sid. For what I'll do is I'll push somebody half his size. Hey. Ooh. Yeah, and here we go. Go ahead. Wait just a minute. I hate to break up this little swan. Jim Cornette. Right Jim Cornette coming down the ringside. He should have that match. And Cornette coming down with an army. That army taking on. So Cornette's coming out with a hot mic and he's got Davy boy and he's got Owen and he's got Clarence Mason. And of course he's got Vader. So all of a sudden Sid and Sean are back to back trying to, you know, keep their head on a swivel to make sure none of these guys come in and get the better of them. So. Interesting little twist there since it yeah. felt like it was falling apart. Maybe let's remind everybody. Hey, technically they're both good guys, at least for now. Well, I thought this, uh, during the, that interview is how, how times have changed so drastically. Uh, all that was just, uh, extemporaneous 
speaking. They all, they both knew where they were headed. Yeah. They both knew the destination, but they created their own journey. They created their own vehicle to get to that destination. I thought that was pretty damn good, uh, for, for the, for, for that interview. And so now you see the big reveal Sid, knowing he got hit with a chair, see Sean with a chair and he wonders, was it Sean who did it? Let's take a listen. Now, last week, I think Michael's fault that Sid intentionally struck him with an elbow in the back. Wait a minute. Got something to do. He kept the bulldog. Here comes Peter. A lot of talent in the ring right now, Connie. All hall of famers, man. One yeah. by one. Yeah. All, all of them are talents. Sid, that, that nice move there, taking the, in Leon, the Vader, uh, taking the close line, going over the top to sell Sid's power and strength. Here come a, a bevy of referees. Mike Kyoto with a lot of hair. Yep. Here comes Here's Briscoe. Briscoe. Where's Patterson at? He's out there. He's got that cool sweater on. Looking oh, like yeah. Victoria's B.I.G. Oh, from the uh, Bruce Fritcher collection. That's right. The Bill Cosby uh, sweater collection. I, I had some of those too. <laughs> I said, I'm, not, I'm the pot called the kettle black there. Tony Greer just left catering to get out there in time. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. How about this? Uh, Freddie Blassie here. Full metal, the album, the entrance themes of your favorite WWF superstars. This tune makes me want to mock. <laughs> Full metal, the album. I bet you had that in your CD player and you played it all the time. Didn't you Jim? Every day. We're still attempting to establish satellite service live from Brian Pillman's home. This is the last thing we saw before we lost satellite service. Well, not this wasn't the last thing, but, but this was what happened earlier. But Pillman inside his home watching this as we watched Austin arrive on the scene and attack Brian Pillman's friends and absolutely destroying whatever, not only his friends, whatever was outside. Austin then after I, destroying. I, I guarantee you one thing, Conrad, those two boys in West Thatcher's group, uh, Probably made more money that night than they'd ever made in their career on a payoff. They probably got their ass whipped a little better too. You see, uh, Steve Austin, the replay here, busting out the glass on the side of Pillman's house. And, uh, it's a full replay. Absolutely. I've gone completely awry. And that's unfortunately still what we have. I know the authorities have been contacted. And now it's time for our main event. It's going to be Mark Mero taking on Razor Ramon. And of course, you're probably wondering, well, how are they doing that? Well, this is Rick Bogner. It's not Scott Hall. It's the quote unquote fake Razor Ramon. Yeah, don't blame me, folks. I didn't write it. Of course, Bruce Pritchard takes issue with us calling it fake, saying, no, we own the character. That's him. That's <laughs> Razor Ramon. Well, it, technically, Bruce is right. We, we, we did own the IP. We're going to get uh, on this. In this main event, the WWF television debut of Kerwin Silphies. He's going to be doing a phone call to Vince explaining what really is going on. And the reason we don't have any more feed from the Pillman household. And I think the gist is, Hey, Kentucky sucks. I think that's pretty much it. How about the, uh, the presentation for Mark Mira? I mean, Sable looking like a million bucks, got this awesome robe. And the pyro is still going. What a presentation. Oh my, let's take a listen to this introduction. I believed in Steve Austin. I knew he was going to do that. I mean, any, hey, I, you know what? I blame Brian Pillman for this. Man, you see Glenn Jacobs. What's going to be Kane here is fake diesel. And you're just like, boy, humble beginnings. You know, who, who would have believed he'd become the uh, mayor of Knox County, Tennessee. If somebody would have told you that here 25 years ago, you would have laughed your ass off. I, I would have probably chuckled, but to, if you knew Glenn Jacobs, like I do, and Not I hired so the guy, he's a, he's so smart and he's such a good human being that the, the world of politics needs more people like Glenn Jacobs. I can promise you. So we see, I'll, um, I'll say this Bogner looked good. Oh, no, in, no. And that, uh, uh, razor attire. I, I didn't, I thought the idea just drew attention to the competition. I didn't understand, uh, the, that whole premise, but I understand why we did it. I just wasn't sure it was the right, we, we went in the right direction. 
Passing the chains down to uh, Chimmel. Tony Chimmel. Tony Chimmel's on, uh, what's that thing called when you go on and do a little message for people? Cameo? Yeah, he's on oh, Cameo. Well, listen good. to you preaching. So I'm going to ask those tough questions every opportunity I get. You're not the man it. listening. You're, You're the man. Uh, I mean, how can you be so absorbed with yourself in asking the tough questions, so to speak, when in fact we have had and had this incident in Cincinnati? Well, I didn't know what was going on in Cincinnati. Nobody told me before I got in the ring. I don't have a crystal ball. I, re- I talked to Steve Austin yesterday. I could have told you this was going to yeah, happen. Did you believe he was going to be there? Absolutely. I sure did Absolutely. Too. I talked to him last night. I knew where he was going, but nobody asked me. Austin is obsessed with Bret Hart. That's what this is all about. It's all about survivors here. Absolutely. I like that you're trying to bring it back to the pay per view. It's less about Brian Pillman, it's more about Bret Hart. Yeah, Vince is dying for me to be a heel. Yeah. He's, uh, he was just fixated on it. And the more he pushed me as a heel, the more I got over as a baby face. As crazy as it sounds. You know, Bogner was an underrated guy. He was uh, a lot better than given credit for. I think the, obviously this fake faux razor thing didn't do him any favors. No, it wasn't a bad hand. Yeah, for sure. Glenn Jacobs, the mayor. No, he's, I, I never hired a guy in my, in my long career that had more character and integrity, reliability than Glenn Jacobs. So, uh, I'm sure the folks in, uh, Knoxville would have a little something to say about that. They love him too, quite frankly. Kerwin Silfie's here. Cars go up in the driveway. So, uh, what, what about what about any noises? It, yeah, did you hear any gunshots? What, what was well when everything went dead? I heard something sounded like gosh. a couple of explosions, but I don't know what they were. It, I guess it could have. Been. I don't know. What Everybody's about, about, a little shaken here. What about restoring our satellite feed? Um, yeah, I asked, I asked the guys about it, and they're out working on it. Uh, they're, you know, they they're not. They want to stay in the truck. They're not really interested in going anywhere near anything. But they're working on it. They said they'll do the best they can. They're a little bit spooked right now. Justifiably so, and obviously yeah, everyone's yeah. safety is far more important yeah. than than our feed. Nonetheless, we appreciate what you can do for us. But I uh, so <laughs> sure. Kerwin Silfies. Hello, Joe Kerwin. Hey, listen, who Kerwin was to WWE back then. Well, he was Kerwin was the director of the all the television shows for probably thirty years. He, he got re, he got let go uh, in a year or so ago. I'm not exactly sure. I asked somebody about Kerwin the other day. They say he's living down in Florida. He's from, live, was living a long time in Pennsylvania. So. We'll see, uh, you know, he's, he's living a good life in sunny Florida and the sunshine state. He was a hell of a director, did a great job. And for him to put up with, uh, all the situation, the, the management <laughs> for that many years, you got to know he's something special. You mentioned a minute ago, how much, you know, McMahon was trying to make you heal. Were you enjoying all of this? you know, get the opportunity to really play a heel on TV and, and sort of get at Vince with some fun one-liners. Was that entertaining or fun to you, or would you have yeah. rather not done it? Yeah, well, eventually and sooner than later, I'd rather not done it because I thought my skills were being wasted by doing that, not doing the play by play. Yeah. Uh, that was just me. And it may be just my ego talking as well. Uh, it was different and it was, uh, new. We, as I said, many times wrestling fans love new. And, uh, so I, I, I had fun in the beginning, but, uh, you know, time, my time me to that wagon with the fake razor diesel, I didn't think was going to accomplish very much, but you know, you would be a team player. It's, you know, I, I'm planning on working it on Wednesday nights, undergoing cancer treatment. Okay. I don't get no medal for it. I don't need a medal. I just need to go to work. That's my best medicine. So the same deal. I love the business so much that it was something to try something different. And it's what Vince wanted. So that's what you did. You did what the boss wants. I like, don't try, uh, to, don't try to outsmart the system. 
somewhere in here, you have the line to Vince. You should feel really bad about this Vince. It's just a great line. Uh, the bottom line though, is you're in a ratings war. Uh, we've talked about it a little bit. Uh, Scott Hall and razor Ramon, the real life razor and diesel have mm -hmm. jumped ship. The NWO is now a thing. Hulk Hogan has turned heel. Uh, Roddy Piper is back. They just did record business at, uh, Halloween havoc in Las Vegas. And now here WCW does a 3.4 rating, earning them a 5.1 share. Meanwhile, the WWF here and a rating stunt for sure with this gun angle does a 2.3 with a 3.4 share. And it's, I guess it's important to re remind everybody that the show is starting a little earlier now. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the first time that that happened. And you heard a little bit of that as we started the show, but Meltzer would write all of this controversy led to the USA network, which was in on the angle from the beginning, trying to distance itself from the angle and apologizing, saying they'd never let something like this happen again and claiming to have had no knowledge as to the extent <laughs> of the angle that was going to be taken. Right. The WWF at first apologized for the language used in the angle but not for the angle itself. This led to the first somewhat fascinating segment of what has so far been a disappointing live wire television show on November 9th with Sonny off in Europe and doing advanced work for a WWF tour in a few weeks and Todd Pettengill with non WWF commitments, doc Hendricks hosted the show and had Vince McMahon and Jim Ross as guests McMahon and his father Flanagan role apologized for the angle saying it was all the WBS fault and his in particular, since he heads the company, he tried to divert blame away from the USA network, which by this point was no doubt sick of the heat when it was in the midst of its own change of management. And even the wrestlers themselves, Pillman and Austin were both on the show doing phone ins with Pillman apologizing for what happened. And in particular for getting carried away with the language he used. Although McMahon downplayed Pillman having to apologize and again, took all the blame. They then read emails and took phone calls from people who were very negative and some were positive with a man, uh, taking the tact that even if the angle was popular with the public, it was the wrong thing to do. And Kevin Kelly was also on the show and explained in hindsight, it was all the publicity stunt by Austin and trying to tone down the breaking and entering type of crime that appeared on television, noting that the minute the cameras were off, Austin left Pillman's house without incident. So a lot of controversy here, so much so that you're going to take to your weekend USA show to try to clean up the mess. what do you think of all this? Well, it was, it was kind of what I expected it was going to be, you know, when you bring a gun involved again, I hate to wear that damn topic or title out or whatever, subject out, but that's what it was. It shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody. I was a little surprised that USA bailed on them as they did, but I'm sure that was orchestrated as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the, that everybody covered their ass is what, basically what it be, meant doing all weekend in the, uh, the following weekend on superstars, you would over and over say that footage would never appear on WWF television again, the next night on raw. So a week after this, it was barely alluded to the gun itself was digitized out in the replay showings on USA, but not in syndication. Of course, the swearing was bleeped and, um, yeah. It feels like this is something that we're trying to push the envelope, trying to see how far we can get it. And maybe we got a little clue too close to the flame here. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm, I'm uh, indicting Vince here. My commentary. <laughs> Let's take a listen. That was kind of fun. I was against it. Here's what we, again, all the way to the back of the house, screaming and yelling. Pillman's got this pistol see, this out, is and stupid. I don't know what the hell is going on What do you mean? Here. Well, like the man with a gun. That's Pillman's stupid. Oh, what the? What the hell is that? This is stupid. That's wrong. We, wait a minute. We do have, we have real, I think we reestablished our feed. Stay with us. This, this happened earlier tonight. We're going to take you back live. We're going to take, that's what happened. We lost. We are live. This is live. Power has been restored, Vince. Guys. Everybody is here inside the Kevin house. Kelly, there's chaos there. I do not know where Stone Cold Steve Austin is right now. Had, uh, was I, any, what, what, did anybody sorry, fire a Vince, shot? Is, is anyone it's hurt? It's a crazy scene here inside out. the home. Did anybody get oh, shot? And Brian Pillman being restrained by his friends. Nobody's been shot. What? Nobody's been struck by any of the 
any of the explosions. Do you do you know where Austin is? Vince, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Do you know where Austin is? I do not is? know where Steve Austin is. What was more damage? He saw the gun. Was he more damage? And he left. Oh what? my God, he's back! God. Let him go. This son of a bitch got this coming. Let him go. I'm gonna kill that son of a bitch. Let him go. Not cool. Call the police. Call the police. Call the police. All right. Get him out of here! Grab him, Kevin! Where? Grab the gun! Oh my God! Grab the gun! Somebody get the gun! So what do you think? Well, you know, for what it was, they pulled it off well. It was well written and uh, well produced. It's just the topic of the gun. The gun came back to bite everybody in the ass because that's what the the sensitive the matter became, uh, it was, well, that show was going an hour. Yep. Yeah. An hour show. So well, it was hard to remember those days. It makes uh, you, I mean, it leaves you wanting more though. That's for yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, it did. It did. And, and it was an interesting seed to be planted, uh, for an episodic television show, no doubt about it. And I think uh, the, the key thing too, is that we're trying to sell survivor series pay-per-views. I'm not sure how that paper you did, uh, but nonetheless, it was, uh, it, it was well promoted. I thought it within the body of this show, cause we're promoting Austin and Brett using, uh, the Calgary connection with Brian Pillman as the conduit. And then of course we had that little interview segment there with Sid and, uh, and Sean that led into their tag the next week. Uh, so, and that led into survivor series. So all that stuff was well planned. It was, it had, it had it has some, you, you asked that question a few minutes ago about the symmetry and, and the thread. You know, this show that we just saw had the thread of the Survivor Series running from start to finish. Yeah. You're selling Survivor Series here in a big way. And, and what a memorable moment it was. It's hard to believe this was 25 years ago today that Pillman had a gun. Uh, in hindsight, if you had it to do over again, do you think you would do it the same way? I mean, just because it didn't lead to a boom in business doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't worth a try, but you knew the inside, were there any long lasting repercussions with advertisers, sponsors, USA, anything like that? I think everybody did enough damage control. So that was, uh, kind of controlled. Uh, it was seen to me like, so I don't remember anything going past it. We just had to kind of start distance, distancing ourselves from it. And, uh, so. And that's, that's what we all did. I don't know that it cost us any advertisers and I don't even remember how the ratings were the next week, uh, on, uh, on raw. Do we increase the rating the following week? Do we continue to build momentum going into the survivor series from the garden? Uh, so, you know, uh, that's, that was the key. That's the key thing. So we, like, like I said, I thought we covered all of our bases for survivor series. We, that show that we just saw had a lot of talent on it. There was going to be a part of the garden card. So for all that stuff, it was uh, excellent. It really was excellent. Cause again, what, what was your goal on the show? What did you want to achieve on this broadcast? We want to sell pay-per-views. We want to create an awareness for the survivor series from the world's most famous arena. And I thought we did a, a decent job of that. My only issue is that did we need to use the gun, uh, and could it have been the same if we take the gun out of the equation? And Austin trying to break in and get his hands on Pillman, would that not have been enough? Did we need the gun? I personally don't think we did, but, uh, we saw, you know, you guys saw it. Did you like it? You know, did you, what do you think of it? Uh, I, I just thought it was a well done situation knowing behind the scenes, what the goal was in that show to sell survivor series. And, uh, but I just think we could have done it without the gun and that would have el eliminated a lot of the controversy. You still got the same dramatic effect. You got a crippled guy who's trying to protect his home, his home and his wife. He felt so vulnerable that he got his kids out of the house and sits the grandparents. All those things are great story points. I just didn't think the gun was necessary. Obviously. As a reminder, this week we're watching got a 2.3 nitro got a 3.4. The next week nitro was up to a 3.7. 
but so was raw. It was up to a 2.5. The following week, nitro was down to a 3.2 raws down to a 2.4. And then on the 25th to round out the month of November, raw logs, a 2.1 and WCW would put in a 3.1 and the ratings war continues and nitro continues their winning streak. Pillman stone cold and the gun. Not enough to uh, break the momentum. Let's do a couple of quick questions and then we'll wrap this one up. Talk a little bit about next week. Adam wants to know whether well, ever discussions of using Melanie Pillman in more than just this angle. I asked because of Sonny Sable, Terry, Trish, etc. It felt like Melanie could have fit into a role at the time. I think, uh, the issue there was reliability. Just worrying about where she would, her head was. You know, Melanie had issues, as we know, we've been discussed. Dark side of the ring has covered that with the Brian Pillman episode back in the day. Uh, so I don't think there's anything serious there, Conrad. We, the, the one Brian, I can't remember. We did an interview. Was it when Brian passed away that we had Melanie on? Yep. Uh, and that didn't go. Let my family save your family some cash. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket but we will save you money. It's not a matter if it's a matter of how much save with Conrad.com. So well, no. So I don't think there's any serious consideration to answer this individual's question. I don't think it didn't go well because of her though. It was just probably a poor choice on, on Vince's part, but I, for one, am glad she didn't get into wrestling. Not because I don't think she deserved it, but I know there were little kids at home, you know, they're trying to raise a family and it's probably hard with mom and dad on the road at the same time, especially in that crazy schedule back then. Yeah. Almost impossible. Conrad, almost impossible to be the parent you want to be with that kind of schedule, that kind of lifestyle. Uh, but, but I, I just don't think she was fit for that. Not fit is not a good word. She wasn't comfortable in that role and her acting props were not awesome. I sound bad to speak, speak of her this way, but I'm not. I don't have any vendetta against her. I'm not mad at her. Never was mad at her. I was disappointed in her a few times, but I think she's probably more disappointed in herself than anybody else. But in any event, she was never really, uh, at the front of the line to get a new gig. Let's mention, uh, Jojo had a question here. Uh, did you know, right then and there that Austin would be the top guy in this company when he was feuding with Bret Hart? Well, the audience was telling us that his merchandise as a heel was telling us that. So, uh, I just wasn't sure as anybody else that how far he could take that role and he kept refining it and refining it and adding to it and, and kept adding to his character and his TV persona. So it was around that time that a lot of us had the idea that, uh, Steve was going to be the next big thing for us. And, and it worked out that way, luckily for the company and going public, nobody in the company had more to do with. WWE successfully going public to Steve Austin. And that IPO was $160 million. So I did. Okay. Yeah, it did, did really well. And, uh, but it, that all his, his Steve's involvement depended on how much he could make his character, change his character or, or continue no, change is not the best word to refine that character, that anti-defiant guy and still do the promos like he did. You know, he never changed how he did promos or nothing. So, uh, he, he had a good, uh, he just had that work ethic and he, he felt it. He felt what he was wanted to be. He wanted to be himself with a little bit of, uh, attitude and, and, and the volume turned up as he would say. So, but it was pretty clear to everybody that we had something special there, but nobody knew how far it would go until it got, got on that road. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to do it this week here on the program. We are so excited to talk about next week's episode. It's going to be Chris Jericho's 2001. We'll be discussing how Jericho made his way through the invasion and wound up finishing the year as the first ever undisputed champion. A lot to unpack here next week on Chris Jericho's <laughs> 2001, but we hope you're unpacking some boxes because the postman brought you a little sauce baby from jrsbbq.com. There you go. Uh, before you know it, that hot sauce will be there. But right now the all purpose seasoning is flying off the shelves. People continue to find that not only does it taste great, but it tastes great on everything. I've seen people putting it on eggs. They put it on their protein, whether it's fish or it's chicken or 
whatever it is, it tastes a little better with JR's all purpose seasoning. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's idiot proof. I say that on my own behalf, uh, it's doing great and we got everything's in stock. So we hope that folks will consider us for your holiday shopping, some stocking stuff or type things and so forth. We've got some cool gift boxes, uh, that gets you a little bit of everything. It's a, it's a terrific gift for the wrestling fan in your family. If you're, if you know, it's a nice way for a lot of you guys to suggest to your significant other or somebody as a gift buyer that, Hey, look, look at that JR's website. There's some things on there. I wouldn't mind having. So, uh, and it's a, it's a product and it's a gift that everybody can share and it's it, believable. It's real. You know, it's the sauce is good. I, I never wanted to have a vanity product that didn't have, that there wasn't good. And I think we've accomplished that our products are good. And, uh, especially here today on Jan's birthday. I think, you know, she had so much to do with all that. She would be proud of what we're trying to build here. And we couldn't do it without the support of everybody that's listening to us here on, on our podcast and, and, and so forth. So I'm uh, really proud of where it's going. I'm, I'm fingers across for an exciting, uh, holiday season. You know, we can, we can cut, you know, we can, uh, Steven links off always willing to make special arrangements. If you need something special. Uh, our customer service is what we're trying to build our business on. So, uh, it's, it's been good. It's been good. I'm just, I'm very curious to see how it's going to go, uh, during the holidays here. Well, it's going to go great. So cruise on over, get the ultimate stocking stuffer for the wrestling fan in your life at jrsbbq.com. Hit that subscribe button here on the program. Leave us a five-star review. If you think we've earned it and be sure to tune in next week as we break down the biggest year in Chris Jericho's career, 2001. Coming up next on Grillin' JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Appreciate you, Conrad, and everybody listening. And I appreciate all of the concerns about my health issues. Be just know this. I feel great. I've got energy. Uh, I'm blessed to be here. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, as I put in an original tweet, it's a bump in the road to me. Uh, the radiation treatments, 22 of them, going to be a pain in the ass, but uh, so be it. That's what I, if that's what it takes for me to stay alive, I'm, I'm in, I'm all in. So, uh, I appreciate everybody do, uh, supporting me in that regard. It's nice to pick up the, uh, Twitter, uh, and Facebook as well and see the kind words that are being shared. And that means a lot to me because sometimes when you're by yourself, Conrad, and you're dealt a bad hand, you can make it worse. If you're not careful, I got to, I got around my friends like yourself and, and others and, uh, you know, my work at AEW is a, a lifesaver to me. I, I, I love going to work and it gives me a destination. It gives me something to do. And I love the support of the fans as well. So I'm going to try not to drop my end of the, of the bargain. And, uh, you're going to get full of piss and vinegar JR every time I go out there and, and, uh, and the rest of that stuff is going to take care of itself. I don't know what else to say, but I do appreciate everybody. Thank you so much. God bless everybody for, uh, your thoughts and prayers. And, uh, Conrad next week, we'll do this again and it'll be good. It'll be, uh, Jericho is the MVP in my view of AEW in a lot of ways. Some people would argue CM Punk now and so forth. The good news about that statement I just made was the fact that there are several guys on the AEW roster that Tony Khan has put together. That's just, uh, you know, they're all one of that top spot. Who is the top guy in AEW? You know what I mean? What I'm, Kenny Omega is the champion. But there are other guys that believe they are. And I think that's just, that's what helped make the attitude era. Great. A locker room full of guys that want to be the guy you all, that's what you always look for, uh, in a, in a environment like this. So, uh, I'm just long for the ride, man. Loving every minute of it. So uh, I've gone on too long here, but I just wanted to share that with the fans and appreciate you guys very much. So Conrad until next week, as I used to do on, uh, WCW. It's good old JR saying so long, everybody. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money, it's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at savewithconrad.com.